share what happened um, to me Monday. Monday morning I got up, it was about four o'clock in the morning, and I was going outside to go to work. And uh, I got up and got dressed and it's still dark and started walking to the house to start working on the house. And as I was walking, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you know what? I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna go to work this morning. You know, I'm not going to sit down because, you know, I got to get this roof on and I got to uncover all this visqueen and, you know, my house is all, we building a house and part of the roof's up and the other half was not up and I risk getting water in and all kind of stuff. So, but anyway, I, I, when I got to my truck, I grabbed my Bible and my Strong's and stuff like that anyway and I brought it inside my house that I'm framing right now and I set it down I said just in case you know so I started taking a black visqueen down so I can start framing up the rest of the walls and all kind of stuff it's and I'm like man I need to stop and just sit down you know I mean what am I doing it's it's four o'clock in the morning about 4 15 and I just I really need to get in a word so I sat down and I just started praying I sat down at the table that I got in Anna I opened my Bible, and you guys know we've been in John, the last three weeks we read uh, John chapter 11, John chapter 12, which if you haven't seen, or if you didn't hear those messages, uh, and last week uh, from John chapter 13, you really need to hear them. They uh, were definitely fresh and hot off the press that the Lord was sharing with us, and it was all about us having table time him wanting to, you know, wanting the table time. So that's what I did that morning, 4 o'clock, 4.15, I stopped, and I'm glad I did. I gave him the table time because I got an answer that uh, I've been praying for for almost two years now that, um, you know, I had no idea it was going to come the way it came. And so anyway, you know, I, I started reading. I went to John chapter 13 where we had left off and but before I opened it up to John chapter 13 I was praying I was praying for you guys I was praying for my family I was praying for all kind of things and um, I opened my Bible up to John chapter 13 actually I was going to John chapter 14 because I thought I was finished John chapter 13 and I noticed where I had ended in John chapter 13 was in verse 30 and it's when I told you guys about how um, real quick that you know Jesus had dipped the sop and that sop it means a piece of bread but it was uh, but from the Hebrew when he dipped it he dipped it into the cup of affliction so he took a sop which was a piece of bread and when he dipped it there's four cups in Passover. There's the cup of Passover, the cup of affliction, the cup of redemption, and the cup of Elijah. So when he dipped his sop, he dipped it in the cup of affliction, and that's the cup that the Jews pour out. They don't drink of, okay? They'll, eat, they'll usually take their little finger and dip it in there, and they'll, you know, they'll say blood, and then frogs, and lice, and they'll go down to ten plagues and that is to be poured out on Egypt and sinners so they don't partake of that cup the cup of wrath the cup of affliction but that's the cup that Jesus dipped the sop in and gave it to Judas because Judas you know what he was saying Jesus's own friend his betrayer uh, and because of this he was given a sop dipped in the cup of affliction at the Seder meal and the cup represents the plagues of Egypt or in Revelation. And, um, you know, it kind of opened some things up to us right there. That's where I left off. 
Well, when I got up Monday morning and I was praying, and um, I said, all right, Lord, we're going to, after I got finished praying, I said, we're going to start reading in, in chapter 14. And, and when I looked down, I'm like, hold up. I didn't, uh, I didn't finish 13. So I just went up and just started reading. So before I do that, I want to uh, I want to share something with you because this is really when things begin to open up to me and um, and you'll un you might not understand what I'm writing right now but because of what's coming because of what we can see because we know there are things that is coming down the pipe there is um, there's questions that I've been asking the Lord now for years. Um, you know, and the biggest one is, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, what should I do? In fact, I even prayed it that morning. And if I wouldn't have got in my word, I'd have missed it. And this is what the Lord told me to, um, this is what I want to read to you first so you understand my heart and where I'm coming from. Um, for the true believer in Christ, the real question will be, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is it right to stand up and fight to defend my family and my loved ones? Or should we just lay down and die like sheep, you know, to the slaughter? Lord, you know my heart, and I will do whatever it is you tell me to do. You know, Lord, I don't want to kill anyone. I have a hard time even killing a bug because you have taught me how precious life really is. Lord, is it right to fight back if our own government turns against us? Please, Lord, show me what to do. I've been asking this. I've been praying and I've asked the Lord this a hundred times. Maybe. This has been part of my prayer since January of last year. What to do? I know that you see all they are doing overseas, the killing of people, Christians and others, beheading the kids and children, raping the women and the children, and all of the innocent bloodshed. I know, Lord, that America will face her greatest fear shortly because America has murdered approximately 60 million children, also has thrown you out of her school system and the court building. In fact, America threw, threw you out a long time ago, and even now they have declared that the United States is no longer a Christian nation. Right now, today in America, wrong is right and right is wrong. This is exactly what you said in your word. What would come in the end times. Lord, the corruption and the love of money has even become the message of the church. And the message of uh, holiness and right living has been so watered down that if you tell someone what they're doing is wrong, they just, stop, they just say, stop judging me. Lust and the desire for what is unnatural is now painted on the nation's capital and White House. Lord, will the righteous pay for the wickedness of this nation? I want you to understand something. Because you have no idea how this has been one of the deepest prayers in my life as a man because if I don't know exactly what it is that God wants me to do, you know, then I can't do anything. And this has been my prayer for a long time. I know, Lord, your word says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. And I know, Lord, you send us out sheep to the slaughter, and that's okay because I know you'll strengthen us when the time comes. Also, Lord, I understand that one day, according to your word, 
there'll be a choice we have to make. Either receive the mark in our right hand or our forehead or die. But Lord, by your strength, we will not receive the mark of the beast. But right now, Lord, the question I've been asking for a long time is, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is it right to defend ourselves from tyranny? I will wait on your answer before I do anything. Even now, Lord, knowing the answer, even now, Lord, knowing the answer, I will do as David did. Before I do anything, I will seek you. Lord, on any issue that comes our way, because your direction is sure-footed. Amen, amen, and amen. The question I've been battling for a couple of years now is, is it right for the Christian to defend himself? And I know you're already processing scriptures through your mind that you might know, you know, and I wrote some of them in there, sheep to the slaughter, you know, lamb among wolves, and there's so many. You know, vengeance is mine, say it, the Lord, I will repay. But I want to share something with you that the Lord had shared with me that morning. And the reason I believe he's sharing it now is because I believe the time is short and the time is close. Um, you know the prayer that Jesus told his disciples to pray was that they would not... Um, enter into temptation. Um, the temptation that he was talking about was, uh, let me stop before I get into that. Um, there's a scripture in there that I'm going to read that's going to explain what I just did, but what I want you to do is I want you to uh, Some of the things that I'm going to be getting into in probably the next couple of weeks is number one the Lord gave me when I was sitting down there that morning. A real commander-in-chief compared to a false commander-in-chief. Number two, David's mighty men and Jesus' mighty men. I'm going to talk about it. Um, Number three, Ecclesiastes chapter three. There's a time for everything. I'm going to talk about it. A time for war, a time for peace. Number four, a true government versus a false government. I'm going to talk about. Should we obey tyranny? Number five, fight or flight. Luke 22. Shall we smite with the sword? The disciples was not wimps. Number six, now I say, sell your garment and buy a sword. Number seven, I take my orders from the real commander-in-chief. Number eight, a passion to build and not to, uh, to tear down. David was unable to build the house of God due to the bloodshed, but it was his son Solomon, the father of peace, that was able to build the house of God, and we know the house of God is people. Number nine, facing our greatest fears. And number ten, beating our plowshares into swords. That is what I'm going to be discussing probably the next couple of weeks, if God permit. Um, but today, I want to kind of give you an overview of where the Lord had led me. And I think you have an understanding, maybe now, of uh, what I'm going to be talking about and what I'm going to be getting into. I believe personally um, that if you're a Christian, this has been the hardest thing for me to face. Did I say face or to ask the Lord as a Christian, Lord, what is it right for me to defend myself, to defend my family? Biblically, I know what the old covenant says. I'm well rehearsed, you know, and I, I know all about what happened back then. But the scriptures that are in the New Testament, you know, we battle not against flesh and blood, put on the full armor of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but, you know, spiritual to the, you know, mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Does this, you know, is, is God trying to tell us that 
you know, we're not supposed to protect ourselves. Is that what is being, you know, conveyed? Because when I hear about people that are buying a lot of, you know, weapons, joining militia groups, and, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I got to just back off. I got to like, man, wait. Especially if you call yourself a Christian. And I think one of the biggest things, you know, God has called us to build and not tear down. You know, God has called us to give life, you not take life. God has called us to peace, not war. Some 429 times in the Hebrew Strongs in the King James Bible, the Bible talks about peace. He says if, it, if, it's, if it's possible in Romans, in chapter 12, right before chapter 13, where it says that we're to o obey governments. Well, what government is that is he talking about? I'm going to talk get into that. He says, if it's possible, live, you know, peaceable, you know, among men, among all men, if it's possible to live at peace. Um, so, I want to show you what happened, and I want to show you, uh, present something to you that the Lord had showed me, that I wasn't even expecting an answer, but because... I sat down at that table and started reading. God showed me something that blew me away. And for the first time, I really see in the New Covenant, in, in the New Testament, what God, you know, uh, tells us as a Christian. Um, I want to say um, I'm not gung-ho to fight. I don't want to fight. In fact, the Bible says to, you know, avoid a brawler of someone who likes to fight. Someone who talks about it. You know, someone who is like, look, man, they come in my house, I'll blow them away. Well, you have a heart issue that needs to be checked. Because if you have the heart of Christ, you're not looking to blow anybody away. Your last thing that you want to do is take the life of someone. Um, because you're going to have to stand before God and give account for what it is, the action that you've taken. And if God hasn't given you the authority to do what it is that you know that you're doing well your life is in jeopardy as well because according to the law it's life for life so this has been a struggle with me for two years since or a year and a half since January of last year um, I was raised hunting I'm very familiar with the weapon um, you know duck hunting rabbit hunting deer hunting I've killed many deer many rabbits, many ducks. I'm very familiar with the way a gun operates and the safety of a gun. And, you know, my dad, you know, taught me at a young age how to use it. And uh, so it's not about, you know, uh, um, in fact, there was uh, a book that um, was just put out. is called um, God, Guns, Grits, and Gravy. You know, and... Uh, but anyway, uh, it was, uh, and it's the people of the South, you know what I mean? Why we towed, why, you know, we towed a gun. If you look around now, you know, I was just up in Poplarville a couple of days ago and I, I saw, uh, you know, an older, older gentleman he had a gun on his side. He was packing, wide open, you know. I heard another girl was over there, you know, in, in shorts and a tank top and, you know, had a big old gun on side and she's in Dollar Tree and it's flopping all over the place, I mean. Yes, it can be crazy. And, you know, uh, so it's a big thing for you and I today. You know, what is actually being taught to the body of Christ, to the church? What do we do in that time? Well, you know, I believe I received my answer. You, as an individual, might receive your answer today. And you might not. Um, it might be something that you still have to pray about. You know, um, one thing that I put in here was uh, like David. Before anything went down, I had read when I was, uh, when the Lord was speaking to me, that, you know, David, before he went to war or did battle, in any kind of way, shape, or form, the first thing he did was ask the Lord, Lord, shall we go up and fight? I believe there's going to come times that you might be required to defend your family. Then there'll be a time that the Lord says, don't do anything. 
So the importance of you hearing God is very important. You need the table time. You need to know what it is that he's telling you. Some people, you know, like myself, and if you've been in this church for the past three and a half years, almost four years, you know how I feel about, uh, about the gun issue and about, you know, uh, I've always, for now almost four years, I've preached against it. In fact, I said, listen, you know, unless the Lord tells me directly what to do, I ain't doing anything. Um, and I know anybody that's been here for any amount of time, they know it. Um, but I want to reveal something to you. Because, you know, my wife had asked me. Even my wife, my wife was worried that, you know, she'd tell you that she was worried if I would defend her or not. And I'm like, baby, you don't have to worry. I'll, I'll defend you. But if God says no, then, you know, well, I'm going to tell you what, you know, I'll pick the gun up and I'm going to do something. But, but that was a fear that she had within her. And I know biblically God has called us to be the head of the house. We're the protector. We're supposed to protect our families and, and do what it is that God has called us to do. Amen. But I'm talking about when we get down to the root of it and what's in the heart. You know, um, number one, I don't want to shoot nobody. Don't plan on shooting nobody. Don't want to shoot nobody. Don't want to have to explain blood on my hands. Um, so the Lord knows my heart. Um, I hope to God I don't never have to face my greatest fear. I was in law enforcement, so I am trained. Uh, I was trained. You know, um, I wanted to be in the military because I wanted to die for my country. That was my heart. You know, I felt like the men in the military, you know, were laying down their life for something. In fact, my wife has heard it, I bet you, 50 times. I sit down and watch a war movie, and I start crying because I wanted my life to mean something. And, you know, these men are laying their lives down. It means something. So I don't have, I, I'm not worried about dying. But I learned that, you know, the system that's now in is not the system that once was. Amen. The government that God instituted years ago is not the government that's here today. In Romans 13, it says that we're to obey all governments. You know, that uh, because there's, it's God that placed these in power. Well, I, I tell you what, I beg to differ that it, this government tyranny system, this isn't the way that God had set this country up. Tyranny has got in, and, uh, and now they're tearing down everything that God has instituted. So no longer is this government ordained by God. It is a government that is filled with tyranny and tyrants, and, and all of this. So, as a Christian, what do we do? Am I talking about firing at a tank coming down the street? No. Fight or flight. There's a time to run. You know, Paul ran, Peter ran, they all took off out the garden. Am I going to shoot at a tank that's coming down the street in my front yard? You know, absolutely not. You know, no indeed not. I mean, that'd be absolutely crazy. There is a time and that's why you need to be close to the Lord fight or flight and um, Lord just tell us what you want us to do so this is where this message is coming from um, so that you know my heart I'm not a militia member you know I didn't join a militia I'm in the Lord's army I don't plan on leaving his army the weapons of my warfare are spiritual um, but I want to talk to you about something else the Lord showed me. So let's uh, get in. Let's get into it. So I want you to. I'm going to take you down the road the Lord took me down Monday morning, and um, this is how it all started. Um, so John chapter uh, John chapter 13 verse 31. I'm going to start reading because this is where I had left off. So after I got finished praying, I started reading, and this is what I read. Therefore. When he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto 
uh, the Jews, whether I go, you cannot uh, come. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another uh, as I have loved you, that also you love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you love one another. Uh, verse 36. Um, this is where things change for me right here. Um, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whether, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but thou wilt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down your life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou shalt hast denied me three times. Right there, I was like, All right, Lord, you know, what's up with, you know, uh, the, this three times? You know, and so if I'm going to find out more about what's happening here, I want to read it in all the accounts. Okay, I want to find out what's happening. So I stopped there and then uh, I went to Matthew uh, chapter 26. Go to Matthew 26. <coughs> Matthew 26. This is how the Lord began to show me what it is He wanted to tell me. Matthew 26 and we're going to start in verse 47. So what we're going to do is we're going to catch uh, the accounts um, from you know, uh, from all, you know, the Gospels. So, because one says one thing and another Gospel has a little bit more and it adds on. So we're going to start in verse 30. Peter's denial is predicted. Um, he says, And when they had sang a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Wow. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I not be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. Peter said unto him, Though I should, uh, he, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the other disciples. I want you to realize something. This is the end of Jesus' life. He's just coming from the Passover Seder. He's talking to him and he's letting him know that you're going to deny me. So um, this is now going into the fourth watch, which is the last hour of um, right before the cock crows. The cock announces that the new day is dawning, okay? So they're in the fourth watch. The sun is about to rise. So this is a picture of the end times. Do you understand that? The fourth watch is the last hour before the sun comes up. So this is also, not, also, uh, not only is it a picture there of what's going on, but it's a picture of what's going to happen with you and I in the end, okay? Right before the Lord comes back. So, it says in verse 36, he says, um, Then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter uh, and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began, uh, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He knew it was coming, okay? And he went a little further and fell on his faith and prayed, O oh, my Father, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. There's coming a time that you and I might have to face this cup, okay? And he's telling the disciples, um, and you're going to see in the, next in the next verse, he says, next couple of verses, verse 40, let me keep reading. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This scripture right here, you enter not into temptation. This temptation that he's talking about is that, that you deny him. 
That's what he's talking about right here because Jesus is predicting the denial of, Christ, of Peter. He tells him what he's going to do. But in the end times, the temptation in the end is going to be so great that you're going to be tempted. Pray that you're not tempted to deny him because in the flesh, that's what it is that you're going to want to do. You're going to want to deny him, whether it be for, you know, uh, to live, you know, or uh, to eat or whatever it might be. And, um, and he went away again the second time and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup, um, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. This is the cup of death that Jesus is about to die. This is the cup that one day that you and I might have to partake from. But he's saying, nevertheless, uh, Lord, not your will, but mine. Um, and then he says, uh, and he came and found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying these words. Then cometh he, his disciples, uh, and said unto him, Sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man has been, has been betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be go. And behold, um, he is at hand that doth betray me. Um, so I'm like, all right, Lord, I see what happened then. Now I want you to go to Mark chapter 14. Let's see what's going on there. And we're going to come back to Matthew. Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 verse 43. And he says... Um, I'm going to go back up and I'm going to read from um, uh, Jesus prays in Gethsemane. And they came to the place which was named Gethsemane in verse 32. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I'm going to go pray. And he taketh Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he said unto him, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry he, ye here and watch. That is very important. And he went forward a little bit and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. It's his death. He's about to die. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and said unto Peter, Simon, Simon, thou couldst not thou watch with me one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak, okay? Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. That's the temptation. But what happened? He denies him three times. So the Lord is letting him know, listen, the hour that they're in, you need to stay up and keep watch so you don't deny him in that hour. Because that's what's coming. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians that there's going to be a great falling away from the faith in the end. You need to be able to keep the faith. And it's only by the spirit. And again, he went away and prayed, and um, again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. Just to let you know, this is the church asleep in the fourth watch right before the Lord returns. That's what's going to be going on. The church is asleep in the last hour right before the Lord comes, right? And, um, and when he had returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, uh, neither wist they or uh, um, neither what they knew what to, to answer him. And he cometh a third time and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is, uh, it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, um, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up and let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Immediately, and immediately while he was yet, uh, while he yet spake, come Judas, one of the twelve, with him in a great multitude with swords and stabs from the chief priests and the scribes of the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he that uh, you take him, and lead him away safely. Uh, and as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew the sword and smote the servant of the high priest's uh, and cut off his ear. 
And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out against the thief with swords and with spads to take me? I was daily um, with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled naked. Um, now I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter 22. So I can tie it all in and show you what I'm talking about. Each one, each account is going to give you a little bit more of what's going on. This is where the Lord opened my eyes. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 31. Christ predicts Peter's denial. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. That's the whole deal about the temptation. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. I mean, how many people say that right now? I'll die for Jesus. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt thrence deny me that ye even know me. And he said unto them, When I sent you out with purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. I'm letting you know right now, you will be reckoned among the transgressors. You know that, right? You won't go down in history as, you know, they're going to say that you're a transgressor of the new law. And you're going to go down as a transgressor. The new government system. Now watch. And for I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. This scripture up here really got me. This scripture up here really got me. And I'm going to go back and read it to you again. Because this is when the Lord spoke to me. So, you see, you didn't get this account in the other Gospels. You didn't get this. Wow. But until you read the accounts in all the Gospels, so you could piece it all together to see what's happening and what's going on, you won't get the clear picture of what he's saying. Now, first thing I want to tell you is that he says, Jesus, and I'm a, I'll read on, is their protector. In fact, it says that um, when they came in to arrest them, you know, um, they was grabbing them all. Right? But Jesus said, wait, hold on a second. You know, uh, you know, they ain't done anything. It's me who you seek. So here it is, the scripture is being fulfilled, and I'm going to read it, that it says, Lord, I've lost none that you've given me, other than Judas, the betrayer. So he is their protector. He is the shepherd, protecting his sheep. It's me you've come after, not them. So scripture might be fulfilled that he lost none, save Judas, the, the, uh, who betrayed him, but was supposed to be lost. Okay, that was already preordained. That was going to happen. So that the scripture was fulfilled, the shepherd lost none of his sheep. He was their protector. He said, when I sent you out, and he said unto them, when I sent you out without a purse, in a script, a purse is a money bag, a script is a, a bag, a, a tote bag, and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. Then he said unto them, but now, why is he telling them, but now? 
Because you see, he's with them now. Right now he's with them. He was their provider. He took care of them. He gave them what it was that they needed. But now, I send you and I tell you, he who has a purse, which is a wallet, take it. And extra clothes, bring them in your bag. And if you don't have a sword, buy one. What? It never grabbed me until right here. I've heard that scripture, people says, oh, the Lord says buy a sword. It's okay for us to defend ourselves, you know, because he said buy a sword. I'm like, look, that's the only scripture that's in there, you know, I can go through countless of other scriptures that just kind of, you know, doesn't. But there's one thing in this scripture that God it floored me with. And I'm going to reread it to you again. And he said unto them, when I was with you, uh, when, I, when I sent you out without purse and script and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. Then he said unto them, but now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And I'm going to tell you what a purse is. A purse, a purse in the Hebrew Strong's, is number 905, it's balitation, which means money bag. So it's the Greek word balitation, which means money bag. Take your money bag. So he, but now, he that hath a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, his script, that's a traveler's bag. That is uh, the Hebrew, that's the Greek number 4082. It's a pira. Take your traveler's bag, take your money bag, and take your traveler's bag. And he said, uh, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Whoa. What did you say? He did not tell them to sell their boat. He did not tell them to sell some fish. He did not tell them to sell something else. He said, sell your garment. Your garment is actually the Greek word, a himitation, himitation, which means clothing or cloak or robe to be dressed or, be to, or to be protected, to protect your flesh. If he would have said anything else, I would have had an issue. But now he's saying, listen, I was your protector. He's still our protector. He still protects us. His spirit is here. But the next verse, that the, the, the writing, the headline of verse 35 is Christ predicts the coming conflict. There's a conflict that's coming. Is it right for a Christian to defend himself? Absolutely. I can say it now beyond the shadow of a doubt from the new covenant that a Christian can defend himself. I still believe you have to take it to prayer whatever the circumstances might be. But clearly, the, 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 the context of what's being spoken of right here, and I'm going to keep reading so you see it all. The context of what's being spoken here, Jesus is predicting the coming conflict. He's about to leave. He's about to die. And he's telling them, when I sent you out before and you didn't have anything, now I tell you to take it. Why? Because he's not there. And if you don't have a sword, sell your garment, your protection, so you can buy one. Now watch. And then he says, 
For I, in verse 37, for I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. What must be accomplished in him? He has to die. He's got to die. It says, uh, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, listen to the mindset. Lord, behold, here are two swords. He says, it is enough. First thing I want to say is that Jesus didn't find, I, I, I kind of found it, Jesus, you know, they were carrying swords and it was okay with Jesus. Peter had a sword. Was there any issue there? He's predicting the coming conflict and saying now take the garment that protects you because you're going to need some protection because I'm telling you there's a conflict that's coming. Now watch, let me keep reading. But I still say, whatever it is that you choose to do is between you and Jesus Christ. If he tells you fight, well then you fight. If he tells you flight, well then flight. If he tells you lay down and die, well lay down and die. Your answer has to come from Jesus Christ. I'm just giving you a biblical truth that it is biblically through from Jesus himself, it's okay to buy a sword and protect yourself. Okay? It is okay. Protect yourself. Not vengeance. Totally different thing. Let me keep reading. And he came out and went as it want to the Mount of Olives. So where was he when he's talking to him? He's at the Passover meal. He's telling them at the Passover meal, he's about to die. And there's coming some coming conflict. In fact, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. No, Lord, I'll never do that. Man, right after that happens, in the Passover Seder, he's talking about he's going to die. He's got to be labeled with the transgressors. Now he's leaving, the shepherd, the protector, and now he's telling them, listen, you know, I, before, if you didn't have a purse or a script or whatever it was, look, now I'm telling you to take it because now he's going to the Father. He's predicting this coming conflict and they need to be, you know, they, it's okay to protect themselves. And he came out and went as it want to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. I like this because unless you go to all the accounts, you'll miss it. And it's got to be in the context of what he's talking about. So any scripture that you use, make sure you use, it's being used in the context. Because we wasn't called to war. He's not talking about war, he's talking about defending yourself. You know what I'm saying? And he came out and went as it was to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. I'm going to show you the mentality of what's happening. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Wow. That means, look, in the end, when things really start going down, you better be praying that you don't enter into the temptation of denying him and leaving him. That's what he's talking about right there. I know I broke it down, went into the Hebrew, uh, from the Greek into the Hebrew to find out. I wanted to know exactly what temptation he was talking about. And that's the, 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 uh, the, the context. is talking about Peter's denial and all the things that's going on. That's the temptation. Satan wants to sift you as wheat, right, to see if there's something in you. Believe me, in the end time, you're going to be tested. And he says... He says, pray that you enter not into temptation. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, he kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be willing, remove this cup from me. What cup is that? He's about to die. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but thine be done. That's our prayer to the Lord. Lord, if you've called me to die, then I'll die. It's not what I want. Understand? Because if Peter would have stood up and said, yeah, I'm one of his disciples, he would have died right there with him. You understand? And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, verse 43, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, uh, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he arose from the prayer and was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. This is the last hour. This is the final hour. A reflection of what's going to happen in the end. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest the Son of Man with a kiss? Verse 49. When they which were about him saw what was going to follow, they know what was coming. They said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? The mentality of what the Lord had just spoke to them about he that doesn't have a sword, let him buy a sword. Him producing, uh, uh, talking about the, he, uh, knowing, foreknowing the coming conflict. These disciples was not, you know, uh, men that just wanted to run off and leave. These guys were bad, son. They would have said, Lord, do you want us to smite Peter? The next verse pulls out a sword, whacks off the ear of, uh, of Melchius, the priest. The mentality of them was, hey, my master said buy a sword. And if David's mighty men were bad, what do you think that Jesus was walking around with? That's right. Amen. They were ready. If Jesus would have said smite, they would have smote. They were looking for them or the orders from the Lord. Why did Jesus stop them? Did he tell them to get rid of their sword? No. Peter, put up the sword. Let me keep reading. And one of them, verse 50. They're asking, Lord, tell us what to do. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. Allow this to happen. Why? It's because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Amen. Glory to God. He had to tell his disciples, let it happen. And they backed off. Amen. And when they grabbed, Jesus said, it's me you come after. It's not them. And they all fled. Because they were afraid. But I tell you something. In Matthew, Jesus said he could have called 70 legions of angels. And they would have came down and defended him. He could have called the, the legion of angels to come down and defend him. Or he could have just turned his disciples loose on him. I believe David had mighty men. And David was a picture of Christ. And Christ sits on the throne of David. Those guys that was hanging around Jesus, those, those were some rough fellas. They were carrying swords. Do you think they was, you know, they was wanting to put their hands on Jesus when he's got, you know, 12 that's sitting around them, you know, and you don't have an issue with Rome, but the religious system is wanting to kill him. They were, you know, they wanted to put hands on him. But I'll tell you something. All he would have had to do was give the word. David's mighty men, if you ever go look into uh, Kings and find out what David's mighty men done, I mean, you talk about one man slay a thousand. One. With a weaver's beam. 
You don't think the Holy Spirit could have hit them 12 and clean house? They came out to Jesus as a transgressor, it says in the other verses we read, with swords and spears. They were predicting a fight. They thought the disciples were going to turn. Especially if they come in to get their master. But Jesus said, allow this to happen. So that it might be fulfilled. Is it right for a Christian to bear arms? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You, He healed his ear. I'm going to finish reading the verse 53 and I'm going to go over a few things. Verse 51, And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye, allow this to happen. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which will come to him, But ye come out as against a thief? with swords and, 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 and clubs? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretch forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And then the next one is Peter denies Jesus. I was praying and have been praying and asking the Lord. And I'll give you guys time to uh, ask me questions or voice your opinion. Um, shortly afterwards. We have communion today. And what I thought was really amazing is that, you know, the way communion fell out this month, they was at communion. They were at the Seder, Seder Passover when the Lord revealed it to them. And here it is today. It's, you know, communion, which is about the Passover, and what Jesus then had revealed it, you know, to us, to me, to us. So if you've ever questioned, and it still might be a question to you, is it right, you know, to bear arms? Is it right to, you know, defend yourself? Well, clearly, Jesus said, you can defend yourself. You can, it's, you have the right to bear arms and defend yourself. Defend. Not, he knows your heart. Peter was the first one that pulled the sword, son, and he was going, I know he was going after his head, son. He wanted his head. But we know that when he struck off the ear, what it meant, you know, where the first Adam lost his hearing in the beginning, Jesus was restoring the hearing back unto man. That was the last miracle that Jesus did because of what he, we know that. Um, I want to go back to Matthew. Go back to Matthew. And I want to complete finish, finishing Matthew for you. I stopped for a reason. So go to Matthew. Um, Matthew uh, 26. Matthew 26. Um, in verse... Um, it says, uh, verse 47, Jesus' betrayal and arrest. Um, he says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast, take him firmly. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him, Rabbi. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew the sword and struck the servant of the high priests 
uh, and smote off his ear. Now, I wanted to read all of it, give you all the, from each account of the gospel so you understand what's happening. All right, verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legion, I'm sorry, I said seventy, twelve legion of angels, that's seventy-two thousand angels. But, but how then shall the scripture be fulfilled, that it must be? And in the same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? Daily you was with me teaching in the temple, and you laid hold, you didn't lay no hold on me. But all of this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. He says, those who live by the sword, go back up. He said, put up thy sword in its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. For all they that take the sword will perish with the sword. That is a, um, you have to realize that we, now we understand the mindset of all four Gospels, the context of what's going on and what's happening. So, um, it doesn't mean, or Jesus didn't mean, or those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus didn't call us to live by the sword. The only sword that he called us to live by is his word. Amen. But you know, you know that if you take up a sword in that time, it's a good possibility that you'll die by the sword. You know? But I wanted to show you biblically that it is right to defend yourself. It is right. Let me go over a couple of things. Um, and we've got about 15, well, about 10 minutes, and the kids are going to come in, and we're going to have our communion real quick. Um, says um, the temptation we talked about was a temptation to leave him or betray him this is seen in Luke 22 31 and 32 note the disciples carried swords and, in, uh, and it did not appear that Jesus had any issue with it um, we talked about um, the coming conflict um, Here, let me pick up where I left off before. It says, um, You know the prayer that Jesus told the disciples to pray was that they would not enter into temptation. The temptation he was talking about was to betray him and give up in the last hour, in which many will do. Are you awake and keeping watch so that you'll not fall into temptation of giving up and not fighting the good fight of faith? Or will you betray him, maybe for some food, or uh, for your kid's sake, or maybe your own life, or even the lives of your kids? Would you deny him? I pray whatever comes our way, uh, we will never, never deny him. Amen. Um, I want to talk about, uh, the Bible says, um, let me stop there. I got some things. So next week, if God permit, this is what I may get into. A real commander-in-chief versus a false commander-in-chief. Um, David's mighty men and Jesus' mighty men. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a time for everything. So all your questions about some of these things. A true government versus a, a false government. Should we obey tyranny? Um, what is tyranny? I'll read it to you. Tyranny is an oppressive power. Every form of tyranny over the mind of men. Thomas Jefferson especially said, 
It's an oppressive power exerted by a government. The tyranny of a police state. A government in which absolute power is vested in a single ruler. The office, authority, and the administration of a tyrant. A rigorous condition imposed by an outside force or agency. Our Second Amendment right came from our forefathers who established, you know, the, our right to bear arms, the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment says this, uh, the Second Amendment, it's a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is not to be infringed. The court reasoned that this right is the fundamental to the nation's scheme of ordered liberty, given that self-defense was a basic right recognized by many legal systems from ancient times to the present. And Heller held that an individual self-defense was the central component of the Second Amendment right. Moreover, a survey of the history also demonstrated clearly that the 14th Amendment's framers and ratifiers counted the right to keep and bear arms among those fundamental rights necessary to the nation's system of ordered liberty. That's our founding fathers who founded the nation on Jesus Christ. That government system gave us a right to bear arms to protect us from the very thing that is happening now. Even Jesus, self, even Jesus Christ himself said that he who doesn't have, you know, uh, he who, uh, who doesn't have a sword, let him sell his garment his covering and buy one strictly for self-defense not that we're looking to you know do anything hopefully we won't have to uh, ever use anything like that number five we're gonna get into fight or flight from Luke 29 shall we smite number six now I say sell your garment and buy a sword number seven I take my orders from the real commander-in-chief number eight a passion to build and not to tear down. And David was unable to build because he had so much blood on his hands. But it takes uh, Solomon, his son, the father of peace, to build a house. That's you and I today. That's why it says, if it's possible to live in peace with all men, if it's possible. And that's in Romans chapter 12. And that goes into the next verse. It says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We're not looking to be, you know, someone comes and shoots somebody or kills somebody that you love, the vengeance part is, you know, God will take care of him. Don't go run out looking to kill somebody because that's vengeance. That isn't what God has called us to. You understand? And I am so hesitant in this message to pick up a sword, which would be our gun today. You know, it is like, um, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when you realize that this prayer, I've been praying for almost two years now because of my family and the people I'm leading to tell you guys this, you know, is a big thing. That it's okay to defend yourself, but your heart better be right. Your heart better be right. Because I believe you heard from my heart today, I don't want to. I don't want to, I don't even want to smash a bug. That's the God's honest truth. I'll move. If I lift the board and there's a worm now, I gotta drag, I'll move the worm out of the way. You know, not that I'm into the green stuff and all of that. But look, I, you, know, I under, you know, I understand life, man. Life is precious. Life is important. Whether a bug lives a week or two weeks or one day, you know, God created him and he has a purpose. And the last thing I want to do is, you know, walk past and step on him and, and, you know, and take his life. That's how important life is to me. Number nine, which is going to be something, facing our greatest fears. That is going to be if all hell breaks loose here in America. That's facing our greatest fears. And number ten, beating our plowshares into swords. 
there's a time for everything. Um, and I'm going to stop right there. Um, let me just end this. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, you know, uh, Lord, you know our heart. You know my heart, Father. And um, thank you, Father, for answering um, my prayer, Lord. Um, Lord, I'm not, like I said, I don't want to hurt anybody. Father, and I pray that nobody in here has to ever kill anybody. That ain't what we're wanting. Father, we want to build a house. Lord, you called us to build houses, not tear them down. Father, our enemy is not people, Lord. It's what's behind it. The principalities, the spirits, Lord. So, Father, um, not only should we be more concerned, we should be more concerned about our spiritual battle than a physical battle. But, Father, I thank you, Lord, that in your word you tell us it's okay to, for us to, to defend ourselves. But still, Lord, in every situation that we may come to, Lord, our prayer, and my prayer will be, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, you know, shall we smite? Because your answer might be, you know, no. So whatever may come our way, Father, we look to you in all things, just as David did, just as the disciples did in asking you. That's, uh, Lord, what do you want us to do? I thank you for giving, in, giving me uh, the understanding, Lord. And um, I pray, Father, that it will uh, give others an answer if they have had the same question. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.